Hey everybody, we are glad that you are joining with us in our study this summer. It's called Christ in Life and Death. We're going through the book of Philippians this year uh, for the summertime. I know this will be different due to the coronavirus uh, quarantine and just it would be difficult to try and pull off what we've been doing every summer with uh, in-home and uh, small groups. So uh, this year what we want to do is encourage you first off to uh, get your Bible, read through the book of Philippians on your own. Uh, take you 20 to 30 minutes or so to do that. It's, it's a, really a short letter. And uh, also, too, just if, if you'd like, you don't have to at all. Here's a book that we are kind of using as a basis or just a supplement to the study of the Word in, in Philippians. It's called To Live as Christ, To Die as Gain by Matt Chandler. And I just really encourage you to do that. You can, of course, you can order the book, or you can get it like that on uh, Amazon or Apple Books or any, any of those other platforms. So check those out; uh, it'll bless you. And um, we're um, we're going to be going through the Book of Philippians together, and uh, just encourage you to check out. Also, uh, we'll be sending out uh, in addition with this video that we're going to be putting out. Uh, every Wednesday, there'll be some discussion questions that you can use on your own, or if you want to do your own Zoom call or discussion group or whatever you want to do, uh, pull in some, some folks maybe you work together with. I uh, really encourage you to do that. Uh, maybe you're uh, involved in something this, this uh, summer with sports or anything like that with school friends or whatever. But, um, but just encourage you to, to bring others along with you as you study the Word of God together. Um, and one thing I'll throw out there too as well is on, on those discussion questions, there'll be a verse. There'll be a memory verse that you can get into. And trust me, you can memorize one verse per week. But one thing I'll really encourage you to do is commit as much of the book of Philippians to memory as you can. Uh, and really, you can't do it all. So um, I encourage you to do that. That's one thing I'm going to be endeavoring to do is to get as much of the Word of God in your heart. As the writer, writer of Psalms says, your word I've hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. And, um, and it's, it's sweet. It's sweet, it's good, and it will grow you. And that's really what we're going to be talking about as, uh, is looking at how we as Christians grow. And the key is knowing Christ. So with that, let's pray. Father, we just come to you. Thank you for your truth, your word. Thank you for the uh, for Paul. Thank you for the church, that that small church you started there in Philippi that has made such a huge impact on so many for generations. And we pray today and in the weeks to come, it's going to make an impact on us, Lord. That we have gone through something that's is, the word is unprecedented that's happened uh, to us in these last several months. And Lord, we don't know what the future is going to hold. Um, Lord, we think maybe things will open up, but they could close right back up again. Or there's something else that's unforeseen to us right now that might be around the corner. Lord, we want to say it uh, with Paul that he had found the secret in all, circumstance, all circumstances that he could do all things to Christ who gives him strength. So, Lord, uh, help us now, and as we jump into your word together, help us to see you uh, for the first time, and Lord, um, in a new way. Maybe there's somebody out there today who's seeing this that does not have a relationship with Jesus. We pray through this time together that they'll turn to you for the first time. We love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right. Um, so I spent a lot of time with my kids this week uh, and uh, the other weeks as well. And uh, I've got four. I've got a 21-year-old, a 20-year-old, a uh, 15 year old and a 14 year old and uh, my wife and I love them dearly and have just it's just been the joy to see things change for them and yeah they've gone through disappointments especially lately um, but what's been neat to see is how they've grown but the question I'll throw out there too is if what if my 15 year old had stopped growing at eight that she could no longer mature, that she would uh, could not read on her own, or she could not uh, spell, or she could not dress herself. What if my son at two years old just reverted back? Um, you know, we were meant to grow. Uh, children were meant to grow, <laughs> and as more and more as the older they get, they are meant to grow and leave. Right? They're not meant to stay in the basement forever. 
or to uh, to stick around the house all the time. You you train them up so they can go. And the same thing is true for us spiritually as Christians that we are we're called to mature so that we can grow and go go to a lost world. Um, and these these uh, verses I want you to think about just. Think about some of these in other places in scriptures. Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Hebrews 6, 1. Brothers, this is 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. In other words, you're meant to grow. Um, Colossians 1, 28. Uh, we proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we might present everyone mature in Christ. Uh, Hebrews 5.14, But solid food is for the mature, but those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. We're meant to grow. And it's you, know, you, you give a child a little bit of room when they're young to make mistakes and that kind of thing, but they don't keep making the same mistake over and over again, Right? Um, they don't continue. If they're at 15 years old and they're still drawing pictures on the wall, there's a problem, right? Um, but I, I think the, the picture is clear that for us in, uh, as Christians, that we look back on some of those developmental days. And for me, the book of Philippians is that. Every time I think about the book of Philippians, I think about those days, that year or two or so after I became a Christian, I, uh, I surrendered Christ right uh, as I was entering into college, graduate from high school, entering into college, and um, and I don't uh, was really just challenged to get into the Book of Philippians by some guys I was in a Bible study with, and again memorizing some verses, but just seeing wow that to to this guy Paul everything was Christ, and um, and he made it his ambition to share this relationship with Jesus with everyone you have. But you could tell also, too, that there was maturity. There was age, not just physical age, but aged uh, growth in Christ. And there's a, there was a spiritual stamina that had happened because of his close walk with Jesus, but also and seeing the church um, uh, be, you know, first off, be evangelized, become Christians, and then those that church to grow and for them to reach out and change the not just the, uh, say, Philippi, but the Roman Empire and the world. So um, I want us to kind of look at some odd beginnings here as we get into the book of, of, of uh, Philippians and just think about what drove Paul and think about what drives you. The gospel, the, and when we mean the word gospel, it's, um, uh, it's, it literally means good news. That's the word, what the word gospel means, the good news. He had the best news. And you just think about that for a second. Everybody's got news that they're sharing. Everybody has an agenda. And nothing manipulative or bad about any of that. That, you know, some people, you know, I know some doctors that have a great agenda. They want to see people get healthy. You want you see coaches that have a great agenda. They want to see players get stronger, whatever skill set they're in, so they become a better team. Everybody's got an agenda. It's just whether that agenda is number one, truth, and number two, worth it. You know, you may have people may have a great product they're selling, but at the end of the day, there's some things that are just worth more of our time and our effort and our suffering and our blood and sweat and tears. So just understand what it, understand this gospel, this good news was the good news about Jesus, that there's someone who will forgive you for your sins, who's offered himself as a payment for you on your behalf, that he did the necessary thing. He, he suffered and bled and died on, you, and, on your behalf, taking all your sin, so that that anyone who turns, and we call that word repent, turns from their sin and turns to Jesus, at that instant, they're completely forgiven um, of all sin. Not just up to that point, but past, present, and future sin, which is amazing. Because their world was no different than ours. There was a score system. Everybody was on, on some type of notch marks of good things they've done and bad things they've done. And that's how the world works. But that's not how Jesus works. That's not how grace works. That grace works, that he does something for you, what you cannot do for yourself. So Paul was radically changed by this message. You just go read about that in the book of Acts. 
Um, and you'll find, especially in chapter 9, that he was a changed man, that he was different, and he wanted to go and affect change in other people as well. Uh, he, if, if Paul were around today, he would go, I mean, you ask the question, where would we go? Sure, he would come to places like Rabin County, Georgia, 16,000 population or so. But he, but he, if you look at where he went on this particular journey, then where he went to Philippi the first time, it was the second time, second major missionary journey, and he went to the hot spots. He went to the major metropolitan centers because there was a lot of people there, a lot of ideas, and he. I guess he also knew that he was he had a short amount of time, and whether how much time he knew he had, but he knew that time and resources were precious. So he would go to New York or Dallas or Los Angeles or Atlanta. He would be going there, sharing the gospel, planting churches, building up leaders there, uh, teaching and equipping the saints, and just the way God geared him and put him together, he was done. He was ready to go to the next spot. So uh, he would do these, and, and the church oftentimes didn't have email or text messages or anything like that. They would uh, send him a question. And often by ma mail, and they were, and they would remember things he had taught, and they needed answers on the present real life situations that they were going through. So Paul would write back to them and give them some encouragement or instruction, and sometimes he had to bring the people's elbow. He just did whatever it took to make sure that they grew in their faith with the Lord. Um, but Philippians of all the of all of his letters, the thirteen letters that Paul wrote is unique. Uh, there is just an air of, uh, yes, it's called his most joyful. It's, it's at his worst. It's, it's, he's at his end of his life. and But it's it's known as his most joyful. And there was something particularly going on that he felt about this particular group of people. And he, he, and he let that be known. Philippians is full of what we call, I, I should have had a coffee cup in here, coffee cup verses or great memes that people will put on Instagram or whatever. Um, and they, and it, it is, it truly is. Philippians is a fascinating book, but it's also great for getting to the point real quick. And if uh, you think about coffee cups or T-shirts or whatever, um, you can see first off like in Philippians chapter 1, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Philippians chapter 2, you've got all this humbling that Jesus did and, and went through for us, that uh, he emptied, it off, emptied himself and, and took on the nature of a bondservant. Um, he, he, then he gives this great, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who's at work in you both will and act in according to his good pleasure in verses 12 and 13. And the third chapter, he says he counted all things, even good things, to be rubbish, uh, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ as Lord. That word rubbish is the, wor is the worst filth you can think of, okay? And that's the kind of language he would use. But it was so st it was so starkly contrasted to what he would see and experience and view of knowing Jesus. Um, and then finally, the fourth chapter, you've got the beauty of, you know, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Um uh, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, Christ Jesus there in verse 19. So Paul had a lot to teach them about life, about what they were up against and what they were facing, and he has a ton to teach us about Jesus. And I just, uh, I would say that life is Jesus. You know, Jesus said it in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Of course, no one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the life, and everybody is looking right now, wherever they are, for something that gives them life. And sure, there's lots of things out, out there that could give you a great adrenaline rush or a dopamine rush in your head. Uh, nothing can give you the fulfillment in, in the here and now, which is very important, but also... What, answer the huge question, what's going to happen to you after you die? Lord, why am I here? Those are the major questions of life. Why am I here? How did I get here? What's my purpose here? What is the meaning of life? And he told them, taught them, the meaning of life is knowing the God who made you and completing your purpose that he's, he's given you here on earth. Um, so if you, if you do that, if you think about Philippians, and then let's kind of put... Philippians on the bookshelf, if you will, 
with the rest of his letters. In Galatians, for example, um, that uh, he's, he seems to be angry at them. You know, all the other letters, he's, he's kind of, do this, don't do that. He's given an explanation, but then he's saying, don't do these certain things or do these things. Uh, he feels that all these other churches have work to do. But Philippians is different. Um, he doesn't appear, he gives them instructions, but he doesn't appear to be bringing them any type of hammer, if you will, or strong correction. Um, it just, if you read it and you look at it, um, the letter of the Philippians overflows with his heart affection for them. And I'm not calling it favoritism at all. It's just, it, it, there is clear, there's something that clicked. And it was their embracing of Jesus, for sure. Uh, if you think about it, if you, I'm just going to read the first eight verses of Philippians. You can follow along, along with me. But it says this, that Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every man, prayer of mine, that uh, for you are making all making my prayer with joy because you're of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all. He was Southern, remember, you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Um, that last sentence there, the affection of Christ Jesus, is kind of odd. Um, that I mean, you don't you don't hear people using that. Hey, I I long to be with you with the same kind of longing that Jesus Christ had for you, or some other person had for you. That seems odd um, because you know, first off, Paul's a pretty tough guy. Uh, he had his back split open five times with a cat of nine, nine tails. You know, you'll see here in this in Act 16 that we'll get to in a moment that uh, he just he took a beating and just kept kept on um, shipwreck. You just named that he was a man's man, okay? Um, but he yearns to be with them. I mean, like he's like if and you can almost say that while he's writing this, he says, if I have if I have one place I could go right now, I go to Philippi right now. Um, and he's like a good dad. Um, that's that's why I would say, or like, a, of course, a hero figure, a savior figure, that this is the kind of love and affection that took Jesus to the cross for you and me. Uh, Paul is telling his friends that uh, he had his in his own heart the same affection for that Christ has for them. Of course, certainly not the same degree that Jesus did. That's not I don't believe what he's saying, but he had that sense of feeling that. That sacrificial, I'll do any, I'll do anything for them. Um, I'll, 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 I will take a lick for them. And of course, that's like a, a good, a good dad, a good pastor, or whatever. Is I'll take all kind of, what, whatever it is, bring it. I will take it because I have an affection from you that I, a love for you that I know is not for myself. It comes from God. So um, he loves them greatly. Um, he says, I yearn for you. I want to be with you. Um, so let's, let's look at some of the backstory. How did he get to feel this way about these people? So uh, we're talking about Philippi. Philippi is uh, what we might call a major metropolitan city right along a major corridor, uh, I-75, if you will, of, of, uh, of that part of the world. Um, in the Roman Empire, that it had industry, it had intelligentsia, it had agriculture, agri agriculturalists, yeah, farmers, but just more than that, there was it was the marketing and the spread of all this food. Uh, artists, it was a well populated city, lots going on there, and so it made sense for Paul to go there. Uh, there was a lot for him to tap into, an opportunity to share the best message ever, and how people can have their sins forgiven. Um, so I'm going to start in Acts chapter 16, and if uh, if you want to follow along, you can. We're going to begin in Acts 16 and verse um, 11, and just follow along. Uh, so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, 
and from there to Philippi, which is a league city on the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in the city uh, some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed we where we supposed that there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, and who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying. If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So Paul previously had had a vision that there's got, there is of a Macedonian man, that area of the world where Philippi was, saying, come over here. And he was asking for help. So Paul took his, his, uh, his uh, squad with him, his, his brothers at arms, Luke, Silas, and Timothy, and they set off that way, and, and it was a typical strategy. If you read this passage, there's a lot you're going to miss if you don't just kind of stop and examine what's going on, that the typical strategy for them was to, first off, go to the places where um, there might be a Jewish presence. Because they were Jews themselves, except for Luke. Uh, this was the opportunity, or had some type of Jewish background. And if you think about the and really the big sovereign plan of God, that Jews were, we call it the diaspora. They were scattered all over the world because, uh, yeah, they, they were given the promised land, but they sinned against God. But God, in his huge plan, and uh, you don't understand why people fall into the sin patterns they do, but you know what? God takes whatever opportunity he, had to, he has and the plan that he has to make sure things take place the way he wants it to because whenever the gospel was first started to be spread, to be spread out all over those Roman roads was all these Jews that they could go to, that they could begin the gospel and, and almost like a, a, a stakehold, if you will, that they could begin to share a beach, uh, you know, a, a beachfront place, whatever, to begin to share the gospel there. And so they would go and they would share the gospel there. And then it, they would get turn around and depending on how it received, they would share the, with the Gentiles. And after all, you know, that they would uh, take the gospel as Romans 1.16. Uh, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who, who believes, to the Jew first and to the, then to the Greek. Um, and it's, that was God's plan. So it was kind of a typical strategy. It was a very effective strategy. It was predetermined by God way before, the, the, before Jesus rose from the dead, any of that. And very biblical at the same time. Great strategy. So that's that's what he does. He's going in, and and this is what he would typically do. And so, th- what would happen is that there was a there would be a, a synagogue. A synagogue had to be formed by ten Jewish men who could read the Torah, and and that's how they would begin it. Now, so apparently there was no Jewish synagogue because there was not enough men. And so what would typically happen if that wasn't the case is that there would be just Bible studies, if you want to call them, all, and usually they met somewhere by the river, whatever, because that would be a cool place, it would, uh, like literally cool, um, and it would be peaceful for the most part and uh, easy to get to all the above. So people would meet at somewhere along a river, and it would be conducive to a Bible study. And, um, and so in this case, it was at this lady Lydia's house. So let's talk about Lydia just for a second. She's from the city of Thyatira, and this tells us that ethnically she's Asian. She's not European. She's not Jewish. She's not She's not Arabian. She's not even, she is Asian. So from, you know, say somewhere, you know, Turkey over um, modern day. But she was also, she also had a house in Philippi. So this, for her to have a house there and to have the occupation that she had, she was pretty wealthy. She had some bank. She was doing pretty good. Uh, both of these areas, both of these cities were major metropolitan areas. So the portrait, if you can, you know, she deals in purple cloth and all this, is that she's a woman who's in the fashion industry. Uh, she's a fashionista, if you want to say. She uh, was her essentially her own CEO of her own fashion empire. Um, so thinking in today's terms, she would have had a house in L.A. and New York and Atlanta, and she's done very, very well for herself. Um, 
she um, she was also not just I mean this is kind of her economic background, but she was as you see she's a God fearer. She she knew that that there was a God and that she had somewhere along the way rejected pantheism, meaning polytheism, or there's a bunch of gods. You know, think the Roman pantheon. You know, the god of war and the god of rain, the god of purple cloth, and all, you know, whatever. And and so there being many gods that you get there fussing and fighting, and, and you kind of have to appeal to each one and please each one. Um, she saw the futility, and also I would say, as we'll say, you see here in a minute, she's an intellect. This is stupid. This is ridiculous. There's no, there's no foundation of truth in this. This is just traditional stuff. Um, so she rejects this and she uh, begins to worship the father with as much limit, as limited knowledge as she had. Not Prada or the, the fashion game that she was into. Uh, so she listens to the teaching of these Jews and try to does it and try to as best as she could to figure out what it meant to, to have a God-fearing life. Uh, she wants to to live out also too the, the her her faith if you want to call it that in the context of her family and her business she's trying to integrate it all and she's just doing the best she can okay um, and so yeah this is kind of an, she is an intellect uh, she's a smart lady and you would, and some would call her use and it's kind of been an abused term today a seeker and so she gets this group of women together to. Uh, hear the uh, scriptures explain. Uh, she ha has listened to the Torah and has known enough that, you know, heard these Ten Commandments and known that she's broken some of them and that she's a sinner and that she's um, also uh, has some likely understanding of a need for forgiveness. And how do I get that forgiveness? We call it atonement. And just reading those Hebrew scriptures and how the Jews would, would um uh, have sacrifices and offerings and all these kinds of things that they would have to do. Um, but the good news is that with Jesus, she doesn't have to be confused. And it's into this saying that Paul shows up and just starts, and he just changed the, the whole spiritual framework through which Lydia had operated at this point. It's like uh, a Tuesday morning Bible study, a Bible study fellowship or a community Bible study or a K. Arthur thing that, Paul just walks in and presses the pause button and says, "Okay, I'm I'm going to explain that. I'm going to explain, explain what all this is talking about and where it's all heading to. I want to tell you about this man named Jesus." And um, Paul engages her mind, her reasoning ability, her intellect, and it's through the the, the giving of this knowledge that she hears about Jesus, because she you know faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17 says. And at that point, she surrenders and believes. She immediately believes and then she's baptized. Her whole household gets saved after that point. And I'm guessing she's got a nice joint, you know. I mean, she's got a nice place to stay. And Paul and his crew, and they wind up staying at our family's house. Um, and it's I mean, it's, it's sweet. It's everything that you would wish for and hope for if you've ever been on a mission trip uh, where you've gone and you've had, maybe you've had no success in sharing the gospel or you've had immediate success. This was different for Paul to have right off the bat to see uh, s uh, someone's entire family get saved. Um, there's nothing like it. I mean, I just, I got to tell you, as someone who shares the gospel, um, whether I'm doing something like this or just where I'm working out or where I'm, wherever I'm at. Um, um, I coach my kids' um, football teams, soccer teams. Uh, there's nothing like talking to someone who's suddenly engaged with the gospel, with the good news about Jesus, and you see the Lord change their life. There's nothing like it. And Paul could just stay there. Um, and it in, in typical sometimes preacher fashion is that we expect, well, it, this is the way it was with in this particular place with this group of people. Well, this is naturally is going to be the same way with the next group of people. Wrong. Because uh, next you have this slave girl. You have a, a girl, young girl, who is not like Lydia at all. And this girl 
is um, going to be a much more complex situation. So I'm going to pick up again here in Acts 16, verse um, 16, if you want to follow along with me. Um, as we were going to the place of prayer, Paul and his crew, uh, we, met, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much pain, gain, excuse me, not pain, gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that there was that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. So, um, a lot there. This this little girl uh, stands out. He, you know, Paul's doing uh, uh, you know, maybe some of the first children's ministry that we know of. It's pretty awesome, and we know that she's as Lydia was Asian. This little girl is Greek. Um, where Lydia is in complete control, this little girl is out of control. Uh, where we see that Lydia was very rich, this girl is poor. She's very impoverished. And there's no indication with Lydia's life that there was any supernatural things going on beforehand. Clearly with this girl, there is demonic possession, influence, control. So Paul and Lydia uh, meet there uh, in a normal format. This, with this little girl, is screaming her head off. And she's disruptive. She's out of control. And I mean, what do you do? Uh, so watch, just watch how God goes after her. Uh, it's interesting. Paul, God uses Paul's annoyance. He's annoyed. Um, and he doesn't turn around and say, I'm going to do a seminar on crazy on Saturday. You know, uh, he doesn't try to engage the intellect. What she, he does is immediately goes after the issue. Her main issue was the demon that had control of her. Ever how, we don't know how. Ever how that, that happened. Um, that this demon got in control of her. And also, too, just we, we know it's just a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. That greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. So... He, he rebukes the spirit, and, and the spirit comes out of her. And, and she was clear. She was mocking them. The, this demon through her was mocking their message. And that's what Satan does. He tries anything he can do to take away from the message of Jesus and the forgiveness that he offers. So the contrast between these two could not be even more clear at all. In both instances, though, the Holy Spirit was the one who gave them this new life, who opened their eyes, gave them new birth and new repentance, and the deliverance that happens whenever anybody trusts in Jesus. Um, and, and also, too, if you think about Paul, and think about you for a second, if you're a believer, that it shows also, too, Paul's willingness to become all things to all men so that by all means he might save some, there in 1 Corinthians 9.22. Um, he wasn't cookie-cut. Uh, you know, you know what I mean by that. He didn't, and he didn't look as people as all monolithic. Paul looked at people as the way God created them, that they're all humans. They're male. They're female. They're um, they have different ethnic backgrounds. They have different socioeconomic backgrounds. But God made them, and they need to hear about Jesus. And so to get the message into their hearing the words he, he would use and things that he would say and tone and everything else would be different. And it's, it's awesome. Think about your own life that way. But the conversions in Philippi are not done yet. We're still seeing why did he love this church so much. So let's look at this blue-collar Joe, jailer, okay? Uh, the deliverance and conversion of the possessed slave girl was very exciting, but what happened next, uh, it is in it, it intensifies, but it makes us wow. Um, sharing Jesus can be dangerous, and it was for them. So pick up in Acts 16, uh, verse 20. 
um, if you got your Bible there, follow along. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore their garments they tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison or in the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Okay. Um, typically, when you think of the word stocks, as Westerners, uh, we think of the... Um, um, you know, somewhere in North Carolina or Virginia in the 1700s, people were placed in the court, in the square of the stocks, you know, and they would stay there. And uncomfortable, yes. But uh, the Roman Empire had it at a whole other level. They were often put in just total uncomfortable positions um, that would contort their body and make them cramp up and just leave them there for days. Um and so, notice right, they've been beaten, and he and he mistreats them. He's not commanded. If you notice, go back in the passage. Uh, they just told him to keep them safe, but he does this to them. He uh, he treated them in a terrible way. Uh, he tortures them. So we're not dealing with a very nice guy. We're not dealing with a uh, someone that you'd want to be around. Um, this jailer is very good at his job and he probably likes it a whole lot more than he should. You and I are going to encounter people all the time that have anger management issues, that lose their temper, that are just jerks. And we got to remember there's a reason why that they are that way. Yeah, their own choices, Absolutely. But at the same time, it's the effect of sin on their lives. Whatever happened, if something done to them, or they choices they made themselves, the only thing that's going to break them of that of, of that chain of anger is the gospel, and that's what um, that's what the uh, the gospel did in this guy's life. And what you can what you're going to see here is that you cannot out enjoy Paul. Look at verse 25 real quick, and this is after the. The beating and the contortion and, and just terrible pain they went through in the stocks. Uh, this is verse 25 of chapter 16. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Um, now, let me ask you a question. If you hated the gospel, wouldn't the apostle Paul just drive you absolutely nuts? That he would be the most frustrating person alive? Um, it didn't matter what you did to this guy. He didn't care. Um, he somehow turned it into a way to praise God in some kind of possible way. And he's, he's, you see it kind of that through the whole book of Philippians, he is focused on, um, the, the way he could praise and find joy in God in any situation. Um, so he's, he's like this. He's the man who, when somebody threatens him, he'll say, well, to die is gain. He's the guy, he says to when when his captors say, we're going to torture you, then he says, I don't count the present suffering as worthy to even compare to the future glory. You know, you can't win with a guy like this. If you want to kill him, he's cool with that because he gets to be with Jesus. If you want to make him suffer, he's cool with that too, so long as it makes him like Jesus. If you want to let him live, He's fine with that, too, because, hey, to live is Christ. He's impossible to deal with. So he's a guy like the Puritan pastor Richard Sibb said this, that Paul was a man who could never be conquered. Think about that for a second. What about you and your life? There's things that just get to us that just eat our lunch, whether it's a, an annoying person or Perhaps it's um, the situation you find yourself in in the middle of this pandemic. Maybe it's something financial. Um, maybe it's worry. And I know there's so much now about worry and grief and fear. Um, Paul didn't let any of these things conquer him 
because he made his joy and the point and the goal of his life was to enjoy Jesus and to share Jesus. So that's what made him in inconquerable. And it's what kind of what in our day and in times past, you just, you know, that's a cool dude. That's the dude that you would want to be around in any and every situation because his soul was at peace with God. And he's the one that could, you know, he can make the right decision, make the right call. Um, because he knew where his security, his identity, and everything else came from. It wasn't in his health, he could care less. It wasn't in his job. It wasn't in any of these things. It was in Jesus. Um, John Chrysostom, who was a guy who was an early church father, uh, he was being threatened with banishment. He said this, if the empress, and he was talking about his own, John's own personal situation, if the empress wishes to banish me, let her do so. If the, if the earth is the Lord's, if she wants to have me sawn asunder, I, have, I will have Isaiah for an example. If she wants me to be drowned in the ocean, I think of Jonah. If I am to be thrown to the fire, the three men in the furnace suffered the same thing. If I'm cast before wild beasts, I remember Daniel in the lion's den. If then she wants me to be stoned, I have uh, before me Stephen, the first martyr. If she demands my head, let her do so. John the Baptist did the same. He shines before me. Naked I came from my mother's room. Naked shall I leave this world. Paul reminds me, if I still please men, I would not be the servant of Christ. You see, Paul became a God pleaser. The God. He became a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. And I think that was a secret. Um, so he basically says, I'm going to, I'm in the middle of this. I've just been beaten. I've been tortured. And I said, I'm going to sing and pray while I'm down here. And as he and Silas are singing and praying, something just totally extraordinary happens. So this is picking up in verse 26 of Acts 16. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. And supposing that the prisoners had escaped, just but Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling fear, uh, and he fell down and the uh, before Paulus and si Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, and you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them from the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and rejoicing along with the entire household that he had believed in God. Um, this is a unique conversion story to help figure out what this Philippian church was like. The, j the jailer's not like the first two people, the Lydia and this little girl. The jailer, jailer, he's basically an ex-GI, blue-collar guy, man in the jail cells. Um, he, you know, he 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 was the, with the guys in the orange jumpsuits, right? Uh, he was not interested in the incessant banter of the intellectuals down by the river. Um, he could not care less about all this charismatic hoopla with the. Uh, the uh, spiritual power that was around that little slave girl. He was a duty-bound type guy. He's like the guy who just wants to put in his time at work and go home, eat some food, have something to drink, and watch the game. Um, not a guy who sits around thinking about the meaning of life. He was a patriot. He had, I mean, he would be all about uh, um, the, you know, the military and the thin blue line and his country, the Roman Empire. And uh, he wanted, of course, order, and he would get back to his well-ordered house. Um, if you think about Lydia and the slave girl, he was middle class. He's not super rich, but neither is he poor. Um, so how did the gospel grab a hold of this guy? Um, he's in... In Rome during this period of time, if a, peer, if a prisoner escaped or was lost, whoever the jailer was, 
was responsible for them, and it meant their life, that jailer's life, if they escaped or lost. I know that sounds extreme, but it worked very well to keep, to keep prisoners uh, uh, locked up. And, but what was going to happen to him was a new identity was going to happen. His identity was this, hey, I'm a hard-working patriot jailer for the Roman Empire. And all that was about to change. Um, he uh, probably couldn't think of himself beforehand only in the context of what he did every day. No different than many of the people, men or women, that you encounter every day. That their job is a teacher and that's all they think about. That their job is uh, a mechanic and and they're they're thinking in terms of of wrenches and ratchets and um, this what they're having to get their hands dirty with every day a doctor anyone that's that's their identity they think about who they are based upon what they do preachers no different um, he <laughs> sees all this takes place this supernatural event there's a great earthquake and it's clearly, there's not coincidence here. Everybody's chains are literally falling off. Uh, we've got a dog. His name is Captain. And he is just, uh, he's relentless to get off of his leash or his chain. And you should see him spring out. And we all, I mean, he is gone. You know, as soon as Captain is gone, you know, he is out of there. Uh, I've never seen him get out of his leash, get out of anywhere and just stay. Is look at his bonds. <clears throat> That's the same way, you know, people are the same way, except in this case, Paul and Silas, if, when they see this take place, they see the jailer take out his sword, and it's much better for, for me to be made a spectacle, for me to go ahead and take my life now than to be made a spectacle of later. Because, you know, there's, this is clearly nothing I could do. This is what you just do. Um, so Paul is totally blown away. After being tortured, these missionaries uh, sing and pray, and now they come free of their bonds, and they don't take the uh, opportunity to escape or to take out some revenge on this guy. The missionaries stay and they share the truth about this guy named Jesus with him. Paul, when he engaged Lydia, he engaged her mind. With the slave girl, it was through spiritual power, but through the jailer, it's just through the witness of seeing a miracle. And this is how the the Philippian church begins. You've got a fashionista, you've got a little poor slave girl, and you've got a Roman jailer. None of these people really had anything in common. But the Spirit works strangely, and, and of course, yes, in mysterious ways. And you see this whole backstory of, I mean, this is not how you would, this is not how, I guarantee you, how people are being trained to um, to start churches today. Um, it's, it's totally different. Jesus takes all these strangers and makes them into a family. And what's so cool about this, before we move on, it's so cool about this, this situation with the jailer is that clearly before they share the gospel with the jailer who had just tortured them, they had to forgive him. They dealt kindly and mercifully with him uh, instead of being, at least just being standoffish. They could have just, just walked away or just not even said a word. But instead, they chose to forgive him and share the gospel, the good news about Jesus with them. Amazing. Um, so you have this new community that's come about, uh, and it's unlike anything that they've seen before. And you know, by the time Paul writes to the Philippians, he you know he says, "I thank God and all my remembrance of you." There in verse three of chapter of Philippians one. Um, and just think, as he's writing this, there's a lot of time that's gone by. How old is this little girl now? As he's writing this book of Philippians, his letter to them. What sort of young woman has she become? Has she got married? Does she have kids? Um, is Lydia still uh, uh, leading these Bible studies? What has she done with all her wealth in terms of the gospel? Uh, what about this jailer? Is, is he still rough around the edges? I'm sure Paul kind of, you know, he hoped he was, you know, in some senses. Um, but has he grown and his relationship with the Lord 
and his ministry as a Roman jailer. Paul knows this church. He knows these people. He has won the souls of this church, and he loves them. And he remembers, he remembers their stories. This is why he's yearning for them with the affection of Christ. And I just I get I got goosebumps right now just thinking about it. I think about my church family, that you know I I love this church family. I mean I know God can do anything, and could have placed us anywhere, but this is the this is where He placed us. Um, and it's just I understand we I, I I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. He knows them and loves them. Um. And I think you, the things we can learn from this experience is that Paul, he adopted this position as, I mean, you could look at him. He was a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Uh, he was Ivy League, if you will, educated. But he took the position that the gospel cannot be stopped at the doors of all of our social economic barriers, racial barriers, religious barriers that, that us fallen humans build up. Um, gospel, the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And you think about what's on the news today, left versus right, racial tension, all these kind of things. You know what overcomes it every single time? The good news about Jesus. The, the, the power that comes when we're reconciled to God. And then therefore, we can be reconciled to people, even if someone who is, you know, could be looking down on me, snotty, snotty toddy, like Lydia could have, or um, some annoying little girl who keeps shouting stuff at me uh, or this jailer who just beat the snot out of me and tortured me. You see, the gospel defies all of that. And when we share the love of Jesus in our actions and then share the truth about Jesus with our words, you'll see a, a small community begin to form who will grow and reach an entire city if not nation. The gospel is, it is not a natural thing. It's a supernatural thing. That God is, I mean, just think, just think about how people can get so stinking set in their ways. And, and what changes, what is really the only thing that keeps that from happening or changes that from happening is when people have a real life encounter with God the Holy Spirit who points us to Jesus and changes us supernaturally. And we are set free when we repent and we believe in him. Um, God creates a whole new community of people out and creates a whole new reality where, they're, where they bear fruit. That you and I have the opportunity to do that very thing today. So uh, I'm, just check out some of those discussion questions I sent you. And just I would just ask you this. This is on there, but just ask this question. Um, is Christ everything to me? Do, do I really believe to live as Christ, to die as gain? And then also, too, who are the people, the venues I have around me where I can share the targets, the, the strategic places and people that I have around me where I can share this good news about Jesus? What are the inconveniences or the annoyances or even the tortures I'm going through that... God may use in my life so that I might both in what I say and what I do and what I do share Jesus with. Looking forward to these this next several weeks with you. Hope this is a good uh, kickoff. We'll actually be in Philippians chapter one next time. Uh, so uh, as we do that, uh, let me pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you overcome you have overcome every barrier through sending your son to die on the cross for us. If anybody is listening to us today and they haven't trusted you yet, Lord, do like Paul or Lydia or this little girl or this jailer and help them to trust you today that they would hear today that God loved the world so much that you gave your one and only son that whoever believes in them will not perish but have everlasting life. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.